Deliberate Serendipity, Principles to Lay the Foundation for Great Change and Deliberate Creation of Your Entire Experience by Heather Barrington. Purpose. Herein I have laid out principles of great change according to my own experience. It holds true that they are of course my interpretation as any author of any work is the receiver of information. An author is a receiver of flow, whom then presents the flow to others. Turn the faucet on or turn the faucet off. Either way, the water presents. My intention is to help you dig, to dig deep. It is not to dislodge all of the feelings that we've stuffed into various seemingly existent places so we can remain in our stuckness. It is to help you to reveal to yourself, slowly but obviously, there was never anything there. It is to help you get back to whom and what you truly are, to be able to share yourself, your true self, with the world. I am writing this to keep short, sweet, and to the point these basic principles to creating a life of easier existence, a life of allowing ourselves to fall into the ease of grace. I believe that grace is the balance between intention and surrender. I beg of you to take note of my struggle to resist my verbose behaviors. This is not some new agey motivational bullshit. This is what it is. It is a flow of words to hopefully help to guide us to the thoughts of an easier path, to meld the ideas and thoughts of an amazing experience filled with ease and abundance out of what may feel like the current existence and experience of chaos, stuckness, and fear. Know that as I speak, through me to you, I speak also to myself. If you've read the four agreements, you're aware of this one. Do not take anything personally. I believe the only thing to be taken personally is responsibility because it is not given. It must be accepted by thyself. Where attention goes, energy flows, and your attention has been brought by some force to this path. Our lives were never meant to be a struggle, and just for a moment we will entertain the thought that we alone are the ones keeping the struggle alive. In my attempt to keep this in a short presentation, I also hope you keep it available to turn to over and over if you struggle with some of this after the first receiving. A human receives and interprets information from their place of perception in the now. So you may obtain more message from it later when you read the very same words. For coaching and or to have the author host a seminar or lead an event near you, please contact by visiting www.heatherbarrington.com. We are where we are. I will also mention here that I am not a religious person, so to speak. I was raised in a Roman Catholic environment. We went to church on Sundays and rarely ate meat on Fridays, even when it wasn't Lent. Religion for me was more of a shadowed discipline than a rejoiceful celebration of source. This may be reflected in my writing, as I tend to not refer to source energy as God. Source, referred to as any name, is still source. Carry on with whatever name you prefer. Understand that with a wide audience, it is extremely hard to determine a basic level of understanding. I am under the impression, because of the laws of the universe, that if you are holding this information 
and it is being streamed to you in any way, shape, or form, you are in the place where you are ready to receive the information. It may be an overview that you need to hear again, or it may basically be an introduction. Admittedly, the points given to me to present seemed a bit jumbled to me and hard to put together. Although they may seem scattered and unsmooth in their relation, your reality is going to trigger you into deeper understanding in the future due to this wording. Whatever this is for you, let it be just that. Deliberate serendipity. Deliberate. Adjective. Done consciously and intentionally. Serendipity. Noun. The occurrence and development of events by chance in a happy or beneficial way. Or shall we rather say, purposely preparing and patiently expecting the beautiful offerings of love in the most unexpected of places, the unfolding of a beautiful outcome through the allowance of the flow of grace. How did we get here? We were all born to this plane from the same place. Nowhere. Literally. From nowhere to now here as I once heard Wayne Dyer speak. I love it when the universe plays little synchronistic games like this with me. As it does with you. We only must be aware of them. How tragic to have come from a place of full knowing to then have that veiled, and then, for many of us, religion or upbringing warped and separated us from our true selves. For many, that is the basis of current belief and also can be based on the ideas of fear, shame, ignorance, and self-loathing, all that source, or the universe, is not. Everything is energy. Energy flows where attention goes. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Nikola Tesla. There are, of course, no secrets of the universe. They are all here, hidden in plain sight, hidden only from our awareness by the blinders that we have built that prohibit us to see them. It's both challenging and easy to have a discussion on energy because it's literally everything. At the basis of all that is, and even from our perception, all that is not yet is all energy in some form of vibration, and yet it is something that is hardly ever spoken about in our daily lives until we begin to harness our intuition and guidance systems. Whether the topic is healing, finances, mood, manifestation, dead or alive, it doesn't matter. Everything Literally, every thing is energy, vibration, at some level. All ideas and material items were once vibration. This is 100% non-negotiable and will prove itself as truth over and over and over, whether you choose to consciously accept it or not. Some people, and animals for that matter, can see and feel energy in a deeper way than others. Some are more sensitive to the resonance and dissonance of certain frequencies. It is not some gift that some have and others do not. It is the cultivation of a basic human instinct that we all have as humans. 
This can come in very handy when someone is having trouble with their own energy field. Maybe they're looking to attract something into their lives and are unable to identify what thought or energy patterns are prohibiting the flow. Maybe they're suffering from the manifestation of some illness or dis-ease and have forgotten the vibration of that well-being and are looking to feel it again. Every interaction as well in exchange or offering of energy in one way or another. I've been able to see certain frequencies of energy since I was a child that apparently are not seen by some other people. The best way I've ever explained what I see and feel on a generalized level is by having someone hold their gaze to the skyline where the trees meet the sky on a nice day. If one is not used to the discerning of energy, a more overcast day would not be good conditions for this. However, we hold our gaze just above the tree line. The vision will take a small shift and suddenly the energy will come into view. Noticeably, first, the energy of the trees will show and it will basically appear to be a light coming from the trees, outlining them in a different hue than that of the actual sky. Then, if you slowly move the gaze to the earth and other objects, the energy of those objects will also come into view. Why would any of that matter? Because when you shift your perception from the chaos of asleepness to observation and awareness, you begin to experience more of these heightened energetic states where what you begin to see will change, meaning you will see things in their possibility and potential without even having to think about it. Contemplate that for a moment. What have we failed to see that is in existence and waiting for us because of our thoughts have been in a different place or time? The human body has an energy field, or let me restate that into the human energy field manifests the body. It is the blueprint. Therefore, the body and the mind take feelings of healing from modalities such as energy work, massage, sound therapy, vibration healing, etc. These are all forms of energy work. At some level, under this concept, everything is energy work, even conversation. It even feels a sort of dissonance inside of me when I hear things like Reiki healing or vibrational healing or people who offer healings. Although I do agree that these modalities are extremely healing to the vibration and can be, the resonance of energy in any modality and any treatment is an offering of intention. It is up to the individual that is experiencing that field and the field itself to determine if it will accept the resonance and transform. There was a story that was relayed by scientist Bruce Lipton. He studies epigenetics and the biology of cells. I would suggest you find him on YouTube. He tells the story of a young girl whom receives an organ transplant from another child. Once the child had the new organ, she began having nightmares every night. It was repetitive so much that the parents sought counseling for the child. The child told of being murdered and knew very intimate details of a crime that had been committed. The adults realized what was happening and alerted authorities as the child was describing a crime that was an unsolved murder case that had taken place recently. 
the child was able to describe and even identify enough detail of the event and the perpetrator that he was caught and convicted. The organ was holding the energy of the event and the child was able to interpret that energy. We create our experience. Something greater than us is driving us. Being cracked open, vulnerability or the wound is where the light enters you. This is the place where the most disagreement usually comes in from those who've had traumatic experiences and or they refuse to believe that we are the creators of our own experience. Sometimes people may agree that to some extent, yes, we create our own experience and we attract experiences to us that we are looking for, but when there have been traumatic events and horrific experiences, how can we dare say that those were created by us? Why would we ever do that? As Earl Nightingale mentioned, we're all self-made, but only the successful will admit it. This is not meant to imply blame. It is to imply responsibility. It may not be your fault that something happened but your response is damn sure your responsibility. Well, I do personally believe that every single manifestation of energy is created in this experience by us, by our inner being. I 100% fully believe that there is something greater than us that is us that is driving us. I like to call it source, sometimes just the universe. As Shakespeare mentioned, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. There is a process to creation, the becoming of what is from the energy of what is not yet. Yes, it can be taught, but I believe this is one of the hardest lessons for us because we must become what we desire. There is a part of us that is greater than us that begins immediately, intentionally, diligently to collaborate and coordinate energy to meet us where we are in our vibration. What the hell does that mean? Well. There's a process to creation that we'll get into later, but basically, as a basis of understanding this thing or energy or source that we have come from that is greater than are we is always inspiring us, simultaneously responding to us. Sometimes we are brutally cracked open, so to speak, and we refuse to believe that this would be something that we would dare do to ourselves. But then we see in the aftermath that the experience had created a wound that left a space for the dissonance that in fact became the crack of least resistance for the light to enter. Even upon reading that back to myself, I suddenly found myself feeling like I was in a cloud of misunderstanding. To put that simply, we get ourselves in a funky vibration. Bad shit happens, which usually leads to worse and worse situations, which cause dissonance or feeling of dis-ease. And we find ourselves longing for something better. This is the ask. This is the place where the universe can respond to you where you are. In this situation, when I use the term light, as a matter of fact, in any situation, when I use the term light, what I am referring to is the source. 
Source, Universe, Spirit, whatever you would like to name the force that is greater than we are, that is in collaboration with the manifestation of our existence via quantum physics and energetic interaction. Take for a moment that we are the tiniest piece of a larger being of existence. The part of us that is in physical manifestation is really very small, so to speak. The larger part of us is our truth. It is the resilience that cannot be denied. And when in denial of this, it will manifest itself as dis-ease over and over and over in many aspects of your reality. As a matter of fact, it will continue to represent itself and present itself to you again and again and again in an array of different forms until you make a different choice. We can step away from our conditioning, our awareness versus our mind. I briefly mentioned earlier that when we come into this world, we are brought through a veil. This veil hides our truth from us. This was part of the agreement. We knew when we came here that this would happen to us and all cognition and remembrance of anything prior to our existence in this time-space reality is consciously forgotten, but it doesn't have to be. When remembered, these laws and truth bring forth a new power for us to utilize in our process of creation. When remembered, they assist us in our purposeful and deliberate experience. We come here as sweet little tiny innocent naked beings in our utmost vulnerability. We are unable to even care for ourselves. We must learn everything that is considered voluntary to life such as routines, habits, reactions, beliefs, interaction, understanding, reflection, and everything else that does not happen inside of our bodies beyond our control. We even learn certain behaviors such as fear or love. We learn how to use those emotions from those around us because we come through not knowing any better and are shown the way by those around us even if it is not a way that is beneficial to our being. But the most important thing that we fail to remember in this lifetime is that our existence is not fully of this experience. It is not fully this body and these senses and these feelings. We are something else, and we are systematically conditioned to forget that and to be disempowered by the lack of understanding that we must go inward to affect anything that is outside of us. Being of this time and space, we are privy to so many comforts and conveniences that so many of our ancestors did not have access to. Does that make our lives better? This is often something I ponder. With so many outward distractions, it can be so much harder to go inward. It can be so much harder to define the beauty and ease in the simplistic yet magnificent offerings of the universe. Generation after generation, we are being conditioned intentionally or unintentionally to be instantaneously satisfied. It has been said that all of man's problems can be linked to his inability to sit in a room by himself 
More and more in our youth and adults alike, we see the turmoil that those are experiencing when the energy and attention goes idle as they do not know how to go inward. Otherwise, they know how to go inward and do not know what to do when they find themselves there. But then again, when we ask, it is given. And we only must allow to receive that which we seek, as what we are seeking is also seeking us. Rumi, the 13th century Sufi poet and mystic, wrote, When I run after what I think I want, my days are a furnace of distress and anxiety. If I sit in my own place of patience, what I need flows to me and without any pain. From this, I understand that what I want also wants me, is looking for me and attracting me. There is a great secret in this for anyone who can grasp it. What happens after we reach a certain age if we never look inward and we are always looking out and around ourselves? What happens when we repeatedly do the same exact things every day and don't look inward for change? We become a body that is driving our reality. We begin to become a series of habits being carried out every day at certain times dictated by the body. How does this happen? Certain belief systems that are ingrained in us from our environment growing up, ways that we learn from a very young age until we are about 10 or so is through the modeling of others, quite frankly, our brain patterns are in hypnosis. This means that you're much more susceptible to learning when you're younger. Once you have developed the patterns, your map, and your reaction habits, your body will carry them out without your brain having to. That literally means that when we get to a certain stage in life or age in life, We are just continually carrying out completely repetitive patterns of behavior instead of creating a new and exciting experience. Sounds boring, doesn't it? So how do we change our conditioning? In all reality, the first step to changing any condition that you have in your life or to transform any situation is to decide in awareness that you're going to change. This decision or commitment can have a few reactions based on your conditioning, such as but not limited to immediately induced fear, doubt, worry, In case you haven't noticed, any word that's going to come after this is going to be fear in some masked form. This is literally why it's so hard for a lot of people to change their lives because conditioning has their bodies feeling a certain way and the mind doesn't want to fight the body. Discomfort. So the body drives the mind. Therefore, Physical transformation, emotional transformation, energetic transformation, and literally any kind of transformation that you can go through as a human being can be extremely uncomfortable. This statement is so incredibly important that I am going to repeat that entire paragraph again. This is literally why it's so hard for a lot of people to change their lives because conditioning has their bodies feeling a certain way 
and the mind doesn't want to fight the body. Discomfort. So the body drives the mind. Therefore, physical transformation, emotional transformation, energetic transformation, and literally any kind of transformation that you can go through as a human being can be extremely uncomfortable. That is where we begin to understand that the change comes in the discomfort. Our prior conditioning is exactly why we experience discomfort. Think about it. If you were the child of field workers, you would be taught at a young age to do massive amounts of physical labor, and your body would be used to it. So used to it that sitting still would cause you discomfort. If you were born to a family that had many servants, and you didn't have to carry out very many tasks. Having to carry out those tasks would then cause you a certain amount of discomfort. Based on your beliefs about having to do them and actually physically carrying them out. I'm using basic examples here, but you can see how this would relate to any area of your life. This means that literally everything that we experience is happening within us. It is being interpreted by us from our perception and our current place of being. How does this matter? Because as Wayne Dyer specified, when you change the way you look at things, the things that you look at change. When we notice our patterns of behavior in awareness of what we are doing, we can find truth in our inner being with those thoughts and patterns, or we can go inward to find different truths and from there change our lives. Inward reflecting and awareness are always the place where we will find the greatest catalyst for change. The conditioning can be unlearned. The lies can be unbelieved. The illusion can be cleared. But ultimately, none of this can happen without the acceptance for responsibility and the willingness for disciplined transformation. This all comes in awareness. In the below quote, my experience prefers to replace the word God with the universe. This reflects me in either choice. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Marianne Williamson, A Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles. Your brain's purpose is to protect you. 
in our physical, bodily, perishable presence. We were designed for thriving. The brain and the subconscious have a purpose of protection and survival. They are not as much interested in the idea of spirituality and transformation as our minds may be. Wait a minute. Did I just use brain and mind in the same sentence with different intention of meeting? Yes. And this is imperative to understand as a principle of change. The brain will do what it is comfortable with doing. It is connected to the functions and message of the physical body, and it has no desire to put us in a fearful or uncomfortable position. The mind, however, is connected to the energetic body, the growth center of the inner being. The receiver of inspiration, the mind connects the reception of the inspired thought or desire to the physical and mechanical manifestation of habit in the brain. Therefore, sometimes there's a disconnection between the brain, mind, and the body and why it may feel like all you're wanting to change and all you're desiring to become is so far away from your grasp. Therefore, it can be so incredibly hard to change habits that we have become so used to every day. As a matter of fact, if you read the words and studies of Dr. Joe Dispenza, a speaker on quantum physics and the relation of energy and transformation, you will learn that when we reach the age of 35, our body is now carrying out the habits of the brain 95% of the time. You can also learn ways to change this behavior and patterns. He has published books and meditations on becoming supernatural, which is one of his titles. It is an excellent book and I highly recommend it. It is said that the best way to make change in your life is to remove the external triggers and reminders that are causing your brain and your body to follow the usual routine. It is not such an easy thing to do, which is why it takes commitment. I am the wisest man alive, for I know one thing, and that is that I know nothing. Socrates we know that our growth and our progression through this life is dependent on just that. Growth, progression, and transformation. Once that stagnates, so does the energy within us. Have you ever seen stagnant water? It collects shit and it never gets clean. We make decisions from where we are. This being known, the universe presents us again and again with situations that enable us to make the choice most in tune with our hearts and our purpose. When we fail to do so, we are again presented. Read that again. If we make choices based on our conditioning, and that condition is not in tune with our inner being, our inner being will continue to ask for the scenarios of the kind to present themselves over and over and over to be able to match up in conscious awareness and experience with the inner being's desire and place of vibration. There are two places from which we can make decisions, truth and conditioning in awareness or an automatic response. The key is to recondition ourselves so that when we are in fact responding in awareness and it is from a place of conditioning, meaning 
we have reconditioned ourselves so that our automatic response has become awareness. Some of the practices that can lead us into this behavior are meditation, mindfulness practice, yoga, and energetic practices, affirmations, and hypnosis. The very nature of these is to draw the attention inward and to the self. To be self-centered is to grow contrary to what we have been taught. The steps to transformation. Forewarning, this one might sting a little. It might smack you in the face a bit. I'm not putting these words to paper as a, this is the way to do it, this is what you have to do to make a change and listen to me, I know the way, I know the secret, I know the truth. I'm not trying to be the one that tells you what to do. This is more of a, I know the failure, I know the mess, I know the fear, the angst, the worry, the confusion, and the grief of not knowing what the hell to do to get out of the place that you've put yourself in. There's the sting. Put myself in? I don't think so, you might say. I'm not sure what you've gone through and... I'm not even sure what you're still going through, but what I do know is how it works. And whether it stings and you shun this information that I am choosing to share in writing today, or you choose to accept this and take it for truth, the truth is you are the one that is living this. In this experience, and the truth and acceptance and choice are always yours. Whether you're making this choice right here and now on this level or whether you made a choice on another level and you are now consciously living with that choice. Here you will find love, empathy, encouraging words of strength, and further choices of ease, but you will never find the validation to stay in the excuses and arguing for your limitations. The reasons, valid or invalid, for holding yourself in the shitty feelings, habits, and situations that you're holding yourself to. Notice the theme? There are three steps in any transformation, be it physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, or financial. Any transformation. Decide. I know, it sounds completely stupid decide. But it's true. There's a difference between commitment and dabbling. Dabblers try, they fiddle, they wobble, and then they give up. When you decide, there is nothing that's going to get in the way of what you want to do. When you decide, you can change your plan 20,000 times if you must. But no matter what happens, you are moving forward. You are past the point of return, and you are never going back. There is one direction and one direction only, and that is towards the goal. You might not yet know the way, and that is what the next step is for. That is why the path is never a straight line. And it will not be an easy one, and you might have failures. You may feel defeated, but failure is only an indication that you are taking the wrong route. And just like GPS, all you have to do is put in your destination and your current location and you will be led via the fastest route possible to the place you desire to be. Plan. Failure to plan is a plan for failure. As mentioned earlier, failure is a redirection, so why would you not set up a plan for yourself to move forward before a redirection? Think about this just a moment. You have decided to commit to transformation and change because something in your life has put you in a shitty place or feeling. There is a major dis-ease in your current situation, and you have decided to make change, to be the deliberate cause and choice of change. Why would you not set up a plan for yourself to carry out for the third and final step of the transformation? I like to set my goals and then plan weekly for them. This changes often after a few weeks of execution. 
and this plan should include the small steps necessary to the execution of all of your goals, the ones that are of the utmost importance to you, of course. You might not know all the steps, and you might not yet, from your place of being, know the way. In this situation, all you must do is to make the plan for the beginning. And with the commitment, the dedication, and the consistency, the rest of the steps to the desired outcome will begin to diligently unfold before you. Although you do not want to overwhelm yourself, if you have small steps to accomplish daily, weekly, and monthly, you go about your days embodying the energy and the actions of the person that you are aspiring to become. And this will ultimately have you looking back at these times as a fond memory of the small increments to accomplishment. You will be so proud of yourself for this accomplishment. You might miss sometimes, and those are the evenings when you say to yourself, what can I do better tomorrow? And that is the discomfort in which you will see yourself transforming. Change always comes in some form of discomfort, whether it is the discomfort that you experience that causes you to ask for the change, or the discomfort of the steps in the plan that bring great change. Expect discomfort. Decide and plan and know that there will be discomfort. Make it your friend. This brings us to our third step. Execute. The other two steps are usually the ones that are completed half-assed, and then when people whom don't succeed get to this step, they quit or give up. Why? Because shit is hard. It's uncomfortable. Why? Because by the time we reach a certain age, our body and psyche, brain, emotions, and habits, they are all intertwined into a pattern that they are carrying out 95% of the time. So as we mentioned earlier, 95% of the time, you are in a subconscious state of carrying out patterns that are ingrained in your habitual mind and life. If you look at the finite time, we have remaining on this lifetime. I mean, really, do you really have any idea how much time you have? None of us do. I'm sitting here writing this to you and I have no idea if I will transition, die, in a car accident on the way to the place that I plan to go later today. Or on the way home or just keel over from some unforeseen health issue no one ever knew I had. That's not said to instill any kind of fear it's said to instill urgency of understanding of consideration of the fragile sensitivity of time and with that being said the goals of the weekend to include because life happens and I had to shift some execution around do you know what I did right before I began this portion I jumped up to accommodate my four-year-old which led me to getting him dressed Then into the bedroom I went, and before I knew it, a cup of coffee later, I was in front of my bathroom mirror, putting my makeup on, and I realized I hadn't even finished the post. Is that procrastination of some sort? Maybe. But it's definitely a manifestation of the fact that I am not holding myself in the present moment. I am not bringing my full awareness to the task at hand. This is the key to execution, to be able to look at the shittiness of what you may have to deal with or feel or think while you are completing or executing every step of the plan or even the deviated plan. Whether it be the fear of it, the hatred of the steps, because they feel uncomfortable. It's an execution. You're executing, my friend. You're killing it dead. May it be a morbid way to look at it, you can choose to be offended or you can choose to let that thought transform you into a warrior. This is what you do. You choose that you will take the pain, the emotion, the tears, whatever may come in that time of execution, and you will transform that energy 
into energy that you will use to accomplish what you need to accomplish. You will thank the universe for the pain because it will transform you. You will notice your anger and let it burn as it is fuel and energy to be transformed. You will thank the jerk that had nasty things to say to you because you forgave them and transformed the mediocre energy they threw at you into excellence. You will. You just must decide. Dr. Joe Dispenza is a faculty member at Quantum University in Honolulu, Hawaii, the Omega Institute for Holistic Studies in Rhinebeck, New York, and Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. He is also an invited chair of research committee at Life University in Atlanta, Georgia. Every progression forward begins in awareness. Kensho and Satori. As mentioned before by Dr. Michael Beckwith, there are two ways that we learn and progress in this lifetime. Even if we are making the choice on another level, we are making the choice to fall into the grace of either of these teachers, realizing that both are full of grace. To me, the definition of grace cannot be put into words without diminishing its profound power. I have found Adi Ashante to be an excellent teacher for me on grace. Kensho is growing by pain. Some sort of pain comes into our experience to encourage a shift. You might find yourself with dis-ease, and that can be painful. And then you decide to take better awareness to your health and well-being. You might decide to take on a business endeavor that ultimately leaves you with less money, less time, and feeling less accomplished. This might make you aware of all of the mistakes that you made along the way so you can begin again and not make them this time. Or it may make you aware that the path you were on was not what you were desiring. Satori is growing by those little moments of insight. It feels that these moments may come to us less often and they often lead to much more exponential growth. These moments are pleasurable they make us feel like we're having aha moments. We do have those moments and even then after, we must consciously choose to adopt the insight and use it to progress. Either way we choose to grow, we must first realize that we are responsible for taking the steps to our growth in this experience. Also, at this point, I would find it important to also point out that judgment is not necessary in any situation, especially that of a healing space. Noticing grace and the ability to choose it as so is enough to integrate experience into our field. One might argue for the concept of unwanted negativity into our fields and experiences, but truth be told, although we can transform the energy that we hold from our experiences, we cannot just erase our memories. It has been said that life is like photography. We must develop from the negatives. Most negatives considered, we arise a better person from having experienced them. Or to even remove all judgment, we could say we come out a changed person from having experienced them. We could experience either one of these graces and then just turn around and proclaim ourselves to be the victim and argue for our limitations, or we could allow them to assist us in growth. The growth of our compassion. What does compassion have to do with our growth, I ask? Compassion is not sympathy. Compassion is the idea of consciously living our lives in the beauty of knowing that we are literally born into the field of energy, the network of energy that holds particles of energy together. This holds every one of us together. 
It is the compassion in our hearts that aligns us with the field that holds us all together. Every experience is an opportunity. I was listening to Abraham through Esther Hicks talk with a young woman about fear of the future and the fear of death. From my perception, Abraham basically, without coming out and saying it, metaphorically described this as being the same as being afraid to let go of the resistance because we don't understand what is coming. Abraham then went on to tell a story of a sweet and innocent little girl. An adult was speaking with the sweet little girl, telling her when she grows up, her body will grow so large that she will no longer fit into her clothing that she has now. This was upsetting to her because she had just gotten brand new pajamas and a pair of shoes that she loved. The adult then proceeded to tell her that she would also be all the time around people that she did not know yet and that she would even be living with people that she did not know when she gets older. She wanted none of this from her place of current being and thought of all the wonderful things that were in store for her was so foreign to her that they upset her. It's true all around, isn't it? We are so much like this sweet little child in the flow that if the universe were to tell us different, even that which is better for us is so far from our place of understanding that when it's offered to us, we think it's not for us. We dislike what is presented and we reject it. The universe is 100% always responding to us through the crack of least resistance. Even when we're presented with things that are contrary to what we believe should be happening, it is happening because it is the energetic vibrational match to a vibration we presented in the past. So all you must do is to bring that feeling of coherence and higher vibration to every situation you can and try to find the best feeling you can. And this will help to alleviate the dissonance of the moment your natural state of vibration is higher and when you are responding in an undesirable manner the dissonance and discord is very unnerving am i telling you i think you should have that high flying feeling that you get from when you reach the high vibration of meditation all day long well no and yes at the same time something to strive for what I'm saying is that everything that is happening to us is happening to us because we are or were vibrating or offering at a certain frequency. When we start to observe with what is happening to us, when it is unpleasant, the same way that we observe those that bring us pleasure, we begin to have an entirely different experience. This reminds me of the time I was having a conversation with someone I know. We were talking about the bad things that were happening and I said something to the effect of, I haven't personally had any experience with that so I can't speak to it. And they said, what do you think you live in a world with unicorns and rainbows? And I started thinking, well I do like rainbows. <laughs> I don't mean that bad things cease to happen in the world. I mean that those things begin to cross our paths less and less. The realization that I was even discussing something that hadn't physically crossed my path and it did trigger a response from me tells me where I was at the time with my vibration. And that conversation in and of itself was an opportunity for me to become more fully present. The warrior who trusts his path doesn't need to prove the other is wrong. Paulo Coelho We do not know what we do not know. When we become seekers, we begin to discover just how much we thought we knew that in fact we do not. 
When we begin to seek in a new way, when we look for change, the universe meets us with the way by way of least resistance, mostly making that path the most unbeknownst to us, the one least expected because there is resistance in the expected. Therefore, we usually resist or question what is being presented to us. When we are tapped into our inner being, when we are connected to our true selves, this is when miracles happen. This is not for us to figure out the hows of anything. These are stories that are unfolding in the space. This is for us to know that we can trust the universe to respond to us where we are vibrating and for us to know where we are. It is for us to question when we have become sedentary and stagnant in our creative process and when we are in a rut, so to speak. But once we have questioned, we then need to open our eyes, our hearts, and our vibrations to what is to come because although we do not know how, we can know for sure that our offerings will be met with like force. Once again, what you are seeking is seeking you, Rumi. We must live in observance. This is not a do not trust suggestion. This is not a statement to expect that when you are presented with something you should ask a million questions. This is simply a premise to remind you, your conscious mind, to be present. The deliberately serendipitous synchronicities will unfold. They have, by nature, been the whole time. Have you been observing? I remember having a conversation with someone about jobs and what I was qualified for at the time. I had been working as a massage therapist in a clinic with clients that had been in auto accidents. I thought I could only get jobs in places like I was in, and I didn't want to keep going from one place to another, only to dislike the next and the next. What I didn't know was that I was completely qualified for other kinds of jobs, and I just didn't even know they existed. We are trained in in the public school system to think that we are to choose one vocation and dedicate ourselves to that. Oh, how awakening when when we realize otherwise, and disheartening maybe, to see that so much of our lives we spent in darkness to that light. This woman came in twice a week for treatment. She would ask me all kinds of questions about her injury and how to make herself feel better, and I would teach her about it. One day she saw me organizing the office because I had noticed a detail that was out of compliance. And she asked me why we still had paper charts. Beats me, I told her. Everything's easier on the computer. That afternoon, she asked me a few questions about what I knew on the computers, all self-taught. And if I would be interested in a job as an implementation specialist, whatever that was. My response was that I wasn't interested in a desk job, and she just sort of giggled. I went on an interview, and after accepting the position, I doubled my salary and ended up in one of the most favorite positions in a company that I had known in my life to that date. Even years later, that position taught me so much about self-cultivation and shutting up when I should be listening that we don't know what we don't know. And sometimes that can be the very best thing for us. The world of quantum physics. So many people are led to return to themselves. They are presented with so many lures to bring them back to themselves. They are gently presented with synchronicities some noticed in awareness, some so obvious but the mind oblivious. When you need to have proof, when you need the explanation, there's quantum mechanics. It is in the study of matter and energy and it's 
smallest measurable form, we can tell that everything is energy, that everything is vibrating. Quantum theory explains that these manifestations of matter are non-local. It is not something that we have room to explore here, but should you choose to seek further explanation of the energetic phenomenon and self-healing of manifestation and mind connection, you will find that quantum physics will give you an amazing revelation. Dr. Joe Dispenza does extensive work and workshops where he incorporates quantum theory into his teachings to help to give scientific explanation to the process by which changing the mental, emotional, and brave way state can cause physical and situational change in people's lives by way of meditation and visualization. Through his workshops, and there are many others providing proof, Dr. Dispenza tells of people that have healed themselves of physical ailments they have had for many years. He also has proven changes in actual brainwave states and coherence via scientific study at his intensive workshops. The book that he published, Becoming Supernatural, is a beautiful explanation and experience. Science is beginning to reflect what our ancestors have always known. Keep in mind that energy work, or any vibration, and any sort, all by de default, has one intention. It affects the energy field of the person, one person onto themselves, both people, or all people involved in fact, to allow the inner being to begin to recognize the abundance of vibration. The physical manifestation of you. The grid that is the extension of the inner being and the blueprint for the physical manifestation of your inner being to begin to resonate in accordance with the law of sympathetic resonance. One person in alignment with their inner being is stronger than a million that are not. It is a theory that defines energy work pretty much and applies really to any type of energy work. It doesn't matter the medium, sound, reiki, touch, distance, healing, etc. The principle of all energy work is the same. It is only the need of the human psyche to separate. Sympathetic resonance is defined by Wikipedia as Sympathetic vibration is a harmonic phenomenon wherein a formerly passive string or vibratory body responds to external vibrations to which it has a harmonic likeness. The classic example is demonstrated with two similar tuning forks of which one is mounted to a wooden box. If the other one is struck and then placed on the box, then muted, the unstruck mounted fork will be heard in similar fashion, strings will respond to the external vibrations of a tuning fork when sufficient harmonic relations exist between the respective vibratory modes. A unison or octave will provoke the largest response as there is maximum likeness in vibratory motion. Other links through shared resonances occurred at the fifth and though with much less effect, at the major third. What this means is if you have two strings or objects of matter or unseeable energy and they are vibrating at different frequencies, they may begin to vibrate more in frequency with each other when presented. There's also a theory called quantum entanglement. It's a physical phenomenon that occurs when pairs or groups of particles are generated intact or share spatial proximity in ways that the quantum state of each particle cannot be described independently of the state of the others, even when the particles are separated by large distance. This helps us to define distance healing or distance energy work, where particles of matter and energy cannot be altered from their resonance with each other as their connectedness in resonance may distinguish them from other particles, but they will hold distinction to each other in their resonance, and how ultimately 
The universe is able to match us with that which we long to experience. The vibration which we broadcast in our moments of dissonance as a contrasting moment of clarity of desire attract that which is of the same, no matter the time or distance. So we experience what we don't want, we realize and ask for what we would prefer, and the universe matches that vibration. Habit versus intention. Starting to feel like you may have heard some of this before? Good. Bear with me. Habit comes from what we are conditioned to, while inner being drives most new intention when we are quiet enough to listen. If our habits are not in line with our intention, we begin to feel a dissonance. Things start to feel like they just aren't right. Like they just don't fit. The things that we do feel pointless, and we may feel like what we are longing for is more, but we can't quite pinpoint what that more is. Furthermore, the more we ignore it, the more it calls to us. Our habits are the conditioned responses we tend to practice. As mentioned previously, we go about our lives most of the time in subconscious conditioned ways. Habit can be a very dangerous thing because it can lead to self-loathing. When we feel this dissonance come, it is the indication that we are not paying attention to what our inner being is wanting for us. It can be when we are thinking a thought or a feeling, an emotion that is not in alignment with our inner being. How can we change that so our habit is to listen to what the inner being wants for us? Listen. No, not listen. I'm going to tell you how. I mean, listen. Earlier, I mentioned that in order to transform something in your life, you must decide. You must decide that you're going to make the change, and you must know what that change will be. But if you aren't listening to what is going on inside of you, to what you want and what you need. You're just moving about making random decisions that never ultimately lead to any satisfaction because you must cultivate the habits pertaining to the intentions that are true to your being. The ego will always try to run the show. After much internal anguish, which is always optional and never a requirement, I have come to the personal conclusion that the only way opposite the ego is to always look inward to the connection to the inner being, the oneness and the nothingness simultaneously, and allow that observation to then reflect outward. To just allow the one that is observing to be primary. Then and only then can you die while you're alive. I've had so many internal meanings to that statement. I had first heard that theory through a Wayne Dyer teaching when he was speaking at an event and began to tell the story of a traveler who went from India to Africa to acquire products and animals. He had come across so many beautifully colored parrots. He captured one of them and decided to keep it for his own. He treated the parrot very well in his cage and fed him delicious treats and sweet things and often played music for the parrot. When the traveler was to return to Africa, he asked the parrot if there was any message that he would like him to convey to his friends in the forest. The parrot replied, if you would tell them I'm enjoying every day and I'm happy in my cage and that I send my love. Back in Africa, the traveler went to the jungle and delivered the message per his pet's request. Just as he did, the eyes of one of the other parrots welled up with tears and he fell over dying. The traveler assumed that this was because the parrot in the jungle was so close with the caged parrot that he died from the despair of missing the parrot in the cage. When the traveler returned to India, he was speaking with his pet in the cage and told him the story of the dying of the parrot in the jungles of Africa. 
As soon as he heard the story, the parrot's eyes welled up with tears and the bird fell over dead. The man was shocked and figured this happened because his pet was in despair over the death of his friend in the jungle. The man took the bird's body and tossed it out of the window to the trash. The parrot jumped up alive. The traveler proclaimed, You tricked me! Why did you do that? The bird replied, That was a message to me from my friend that if I want to escape the cage, I must die while I am alive. Some would see the cage as a representation of the body, as I have heard it referred to in the story. I personally see the cage as the actual act of suffering. Therein to me lies the disconnection. Such terrible sorrow that could lead one to the desire for escape, not realizing, for whatever reason, feeling so real, that one can die while they're alive to escape the suffering. The death of the ego to the desires of the inner being sounds like such an easy concept, and yet we as humans over and over create suffering. Pain is inevitable in this experience. Suffering is optional. Our restlessness will not let us stay where we are. It will cause such a dissonance that it will make us physically sick if we do not listen. We have a chance in every opportunity to choose either love or fear. There are only these emotions. This is about accepting responsibility or responsibility for the way we respond to what happens around us and for considering our emotions. Emotions are just energy in motion. We remember what energy is, right? It is the basis of everything. If emotions are energy in motion, then what is happening when we are in a state of lower vibration frequency emotions. We are creating experiences that are in the lower vibration of the spectrum. Not ideal, right? There are two sides of the emotional and energetic spectrum, love and fear. Love, joy, passion, positivity, optimism, hopefulness, contentment, boredom, pessimism, frustration, overwhelm, disappointment, doubt, worry, blame, discouragement, anger, hate, jealousy, insecurity, grief, and fear. Love and fear, these two emotions are the extreme of each side of the spectrum. Love is our natural state and it is where we land when we strip away all that is not. It is that simple and that complicated all at once. Isn't everything? But really, where does the complication come from? It comes from all the conditioning and experience that we've already been discussing. Instead of the overwhelming feeling of the need to learn so many things in order to overcome fear and the negative feelings, we now know that we can choose to pivot to the next best feeling. We can grasp within our reach. We can move up the spectrum even if it isn't very far. One gets us to the next and to the next until we ultimately feel better. That is the purpose. Abraham and many others have provided us with many tools that can be used to navigate the emotional spectrum to assist us in getting in line with our vortex and experiencing an all-around better feeling life. We came to be creators. We came to be for me, not to me. And ultimately, we discover through me, and we are all me. Sometimes, 
We need many reminders to bring us back to the fact that the universe is happening by us, not to us. The number one step in the journey is to awaken to the signs presented to us by the universe. Those signs must always, at first and continually, are feelings that come from within. When we can give our attention to the feelings that are emanating from within us, we can choose a higher vibrational feeling from where we are. If we are in fear, we can look at our fear and choose better. If we are in love, we can look at our love with appreciation and then have more of it. The emotional scale can also be found on my website at www.heatherbearington.com. Abraham is source channeled through Esther Hicks. Telling a new story can literally change everything. It is how it works. Just as there are two sides of the emotional spectrum, the basis of the creational spectrum also has two correlating feelings, victim and empowerment. A victim is someone that sees the world as happening to them. Empowerment is seeing the world as happening through you, for you, and as one with you. We get to choose the view from which we stand and experience. By no means am I telling you to not grieve. In no way am I telling you that the emotion on the spectrum side of fear has no place. What I am saying is that in your total awareness, we choose which emotion we will bring our energy and attention to. We can most certainly choose also the story that we are telling and writing. Remembered, it must be always that we are writing the unfolding. We are active participants in the unfolding. In hypnosis, the hypnotist will often assist the client into a nice, deep, comfortable trance, and then when they are the most receptive to suggestion, present this in the form of a metaphorical story. Why? Because the brain and the subconscious are smart enough to interpret the meaning of these. This is being done to us over and over Actually, throughout every day and most of the time, we are not even conscious of it. NLP, hypnosis, and other forms of trance and suggestion are imposed and presented, both generically and metaphorically, in order to produce outcomes. Many political parties, salespeople, teachers, speakers, influencers, etc. will take NLP and hypnosis classes and may be familiar with the mind's response to frequency and speech patterns, so they can use these to their benefit or the benefit of the recipient. This is not always a bad thing, as it is a technique used in healing modalities as well. The exact same scenario is happening with the story that you're telling the universe. You can be telling that story consciously or subconsciously. The universe doesn't care. It's just giving you what you want and what you're asking for. Look around you. What have you been asking for? Many books of wisdom will mention ask and it is given. And you can be telling the story verbally or energetically. You can even be telling one story with your mouth and something entirely different with your energy and thoughts. That is entirely the point of this book. There are Four items that much match the frequency of those of the desired outcome. Your thoughts, your beliefs, your feelings, and your actions. The best way to take a glimpse into what you're asking for, if you're not aware of it, is to look at the energy that you're putting out right now and what is what it is yielding you. Look around at your right this moment experience. Look around at your right this moment reality and you will see what your energy has been beckoning. 
It might not be a direct beckoning of a specific experience, but literally, if you keep writing the same story of lack, victimhood, and complaint, you're just going to keep getting more of what you're writing. Thank you is the only prayer you will ever need to recite in your heart. Thank you is the only prayer you will ever need to recite in your heart because it brings you immediately to the vibration of gratitude and even higher to appreciation, love. It is even in the shitty times, if you will, that we can stop and take a moment of appreciation for what is happening. Okay, maybe after the fact, because it is in those times that we're able to see the major contract of contrast of the reality that we have created. We can determine that what is happening is not what is desirable to us, and it is not what we want. It is in those moments of contrast that we send out our ask to the universe ever so strongly towards what it is we really do want to come into our lives. The key is in how long we focus on the negativity of the occurrence and then move forward. It isn't just true for the physical manifestation of objects and circumstances. It's also true for emotions and anything energetic, which is, well, everything. We don't need to spend too much time here with this. It's the silver lining concept, so to speak to realize that everything is happening absolutely through us and we are only to see the what isness of it, accept it and move through it. The acceptance of it is the way through anything. Sometimes by grace an occurrence in our lives that is small will remind us of the existence of this basis. Like perhaps the flat tire that placed us in the store the moment someone very important walked in, or the rejection of a position we really believed we wanted, which forced us to seek elsewhere, landing us in the most benevolent of positions. The coordination of circumstance is much, much more complex than we can or need to understand. We need not try. What if equals fear. What is equals reality. Just as there are two ways to grow from learning, there are two base perspectives. We can say what if and we can say what is. What if is never yet truth. What if is usually fear. I like to play a little game with myself called the what if game, where I'm in a sticky situation and my mind starts to do the what if thing. I usually know that I'm there because it feels yucky. Like when you're about to put your unaccompanied minor on a plane and you start to imagine all the things that can go wrong in that situation, which we need not get into, trust me. My mind over the years has probably been creative enough to figure them all out. Either way, this year, as I was putting him on the plane to fly halfway across the country, I chose to focus on all the ways that he's protected, truly safe, on how the airport, they favor and dote specifically on the unaccompanied minors, how they give them preferential treatment, and they make sure that they're comfortable and secure. It felt much better, and that's what we are always reaching for, to feel better. When we become confident in the fact that we are creating our own experience, we tend to notice our thoughts more so and can catch ourselves before or during creating a stagnant or toxic emotional experience for ourselves. The fear presents itself as a much more dissonant feeling to our calmer selves showing us the greatest amount of contrast in feeling to that which our inner being truly desires, believes, and feels, and would have done. The what is, or the reality, is indeed as well all about perspective. 
On the opposition of fear, taking the what is approach means just looking at things for what they really have already manifested into in that moment. This is in reference to staying on the positive side of the emotional spectrum. If we find ourselves creeping towards fear, we can literally stop and look at what is and begin to advance up the emotional scale from that place. Opposing would be to begin in fear and spiral down the what-if staircase, thought by thought, until we trip over our own feet and face plant in an imagined mess. That then repeats itself in one way or another. Ignorance truly is bliss. We must keep at the forefront of our awareness for immediate consideration how much of our energy we are spending and in what area of our lives. Remember that where your attention goes, your energy flows. Remember this always. When you are thinking thoughts of political nature, of blame, of hate, of frustration, we must bring our own attention to what we are scripting for the story. Because whatever we are thinking and spreading, focusing our attention on, we are creating. We are inflating and multiplying in force. Remember this when you are focusing on the negative side of a person's behavior or simply even spreading an image on social media. Thoughts and actions are energy amplifiers. Spend your energetic currency wisely. What is this? When I was younger, and I had some allergy business going on with my nose, I would say I had snifflingitis. I loved to make things up and words that cracked things. So in the realization of living as a deliberate creator of my own experience, I have appreciatively adopted the idea of what is this. The act of changing the reality of what is into something of a light-hearted understanding that is simply a projection, a manifestation, creates the ability to look upon the what isness of things without getting sucked into a vortex of desperation. Delving into the feeling of lack as we are taking note of what is, which is not what we desire, And an even bigger note of what is not, as a double negative will do, multiplies the effect of the thought. That way, one can train themselves to look at the what isness of things simply as the observer, as the human being, not the human thinking or the human analyzing or the human questioning. Oh, here I am watching her watch what is while she is thinking of what she is not yet. You see, in that manner, the energy and the attention is not multiplied in the present circumstance, but in the desired outcome, all the while realizing on a vibrational level in a feeling of connectedness, coherence, and expansion. Many of us have heard that we are not humans having a spiritual experience. But have we actualized the power in that thought alone? The vibration and expansibility of that in and of itself. We are not humans that are wandering around like lost puppies trying to find our way. We are ever connected ever-expanding and created spirits, trying to repeatedly remind ourselves that we are divinity, we are tiny little pieces of that which creates worlds, and we are here having a human experience, having come in order to utilize our power in this place of universal laws, to grow ourselves and each other, which are truly one and the same. You are enough. You deserve everything you want, and you are easy to connect with. Just as exists the law of attraction, there are other universal laws that are simply of existence. 
They can only be seen in opposition of when one is pinching off the receiving energy, a sort of kinking in the hose. These laws are such as you are deserving simply because you are, not because you work hard, not because you've been through so many things that should have broken you. I see so many of these posts on social media that refer to the illusion that I've been through so much of said struggle that I'm now ready to see the other side or I've hurt so much, don't I deserve yada yada yada. You see, you don't have to struggle for that. You never had to sit in the energy of what you had experienced or to tell the story over and over and over or to explain your traumas as the explanation as to why you went through the trauma. But the situation may have helped you to focus yourself more. The contrast allowed you to be more deliberate in your asking. This is not a competition of whom can do more or feel worse. And then that deserves them the golden ticket. You see, it works the opposite. Those that feel bad and dwell and retell the stories of heartache, struggle, and lack are telling stories of heartache, trouble, and lack, no matter what context, they are attracting more of the same. You may argue for your limitations at this point all you'd like, but you're telling that story. It's your choice. Whatever story works for you. Innate connection. Whenever we feel bad, it is because what our spirit or our inner being believes about a situation is different than what we are allowing ourselves to feel at that moment. If you haven't already noticed, you may begin to feel the dissonance or the unnerving mismatch, so to speak. I like to pin it as a cognitive dissonance, noticing an awareness turning inward and pay attention. Your energy flows where your attention goes. Satisfaction is the amount of your inner being that you are allowing to flow right now. I hear the voice wherever I go. No matter the situation, your gut, your emotions, and your thoughts act as your physical compass to your inner being. Listen. Keep happening over and over. Your evolution is in your own hands. If you strive, you can evolve whichever way you want. You just must realize what it is you are really asking for. Remember, as we mentioned in the beginning, and as Earl Nightingale mentioned, we are all self-made, but only the successful will admit it. You alone are the captain of your ship. You can sail through smooth and rough waters, or you can choose to focus on all the storms and eventually sink that puppy. Your thoughts will literally begin to shape your biology. They are powerful enough to change your DNA. This is you taking responsibility for shaping your life. How to apply these basic principles as a basis of understanding to create change in your life. Noticing and awareness. Turning inward to check on your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Do this often. Remember that. I hear the voice wherever I go. These are the exact same concepts. Take notice to the signs and the synchronicity that are cluing you into the fact that you are on the right path, that your inner being is calling you to come this way. That is the way that is leaking to you through the path of least resistance. The universe gives you everything you're seeking through the crack of least resistance. Repetition. Repetition is comforting to the mind. Notice your habits and begin to practice a meditation daily. 
Begin to replace habits that are not serving you with those that foster your inner being. Meditation is a time of connection and coherence. It is when the brain enters a specific wave state and you become a higher vibration. This is the state in which you are closer to the vibration of your inner being, to the oneness, and you are able to receive, even in downloadable fashion, the place where your thoughts are presented to you. You don't even think them. You can find specific guided meditations on YouTube which are easier for beginners to practice as they occupy the conscious mind so the subconscious can relax and not consistently wondering, am I doing this right? Or nothing's happening? The truth with meditation really comes with consistent practice. Some may have radical experiences the first time and it may take others as a much longer time of consistent practice to begin to let go of the here and now, the connection to the body and the physicality of this realm, and to connect to the space that is consistent of the nothingness from which we came, and of which we will eventually return. That space creates worlds. The source that we have access to at any given moment in time. The more you practice and give attention to the power, the source, and to your inner being and emotional guidance system, the more you will see the unfolding and begin to feel like the unfolding is becoming more magical and less mundane. The universe has got your back. Put your attention there and you will see. The true way is to always and in all ways choose to feel better in the moment. For coaching and or to have the author host a seminar or lead an event near you, please contact by visiting www.heatherbarrington.com. We are...